I've gotten a bunch of comments and direct emails on this one. Today, I'm going to be looking at Nucleares. Not sure if that's how you pronounce it. I believe it's Portuguese. This is a video game simulator. This original video is by P. Gatcom. But first, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's get right into it. So in this video, I'm going to be kind of walking you through uh, sort of what everything is and sort of what everything does. So when you start playing this game, you have a better idea of uh, what it is you're trying to kind of like manipulate or like would play with, if that makes sense to you. So anyway, the purpose of this game, of course, is generate electricity and uh, generating electricity, of course, by using our lovely pressurized water reactor, which uh, you can see the core sitting right there where my mouse is pointing. <laughs> So the core is sitting right outside of the control room, not in a commercial pressurized water reactor. It also looks here that, okay, we got just the refueling pool and we're clearly, sh we're clearly shut down right now because right now it's open. There's, uh, there's no reactor. The reactor vessel, the reactor vessel head has been removed and it looks like we've got pipes going into it from above. That's weird. You, you'd never see that because due to uh, seismic concerns, um, earthquake concerns, you would actually see the pipes would be going in underneath at lower levels uh, from, where the, uh, from where the pool is, is located. It would still be above the fuel. So you can discharge water over the fuel, things like the residual heat removal system, the emergency core cooling system. You're not going to have pipes suspended above the core. All kinds of protocol has to happen. This is when you're refueling before you can put loads over there. Also, refueling would be kind of a nightmare because you'd have to navigate the fuel assemblies around each of these pipes. So that's another reason why you don't do that. Hovering just a little bit out of the reactor containment room there itself, which is pretty impressive. Also, the uh, control room is not in the same room as the reactor containment building. The control room at the plant I called it would be in the electrical auxiliary building. And everything in the reactor containment building is operated remotely. Granted, and things can be operated manually. You can send an operator in there to manually operate certain valves, ones that are not near the reactor because of high dose rates, things that are within the reactor coolant system, but not to mention high temperatures and high pressures. But there are a lot of other components that can be locally operated in the reactor containment building if need be, but it's in a completely different area. I've Never heard of a control room being inside the reactor containment building. And the reason for that is you just, the containment building is when an accident happens, its design function is to withstand the extreme levels of pressure, temperature, and radiation and contain that within there. You do not want people to be contained in there with those, with that hazardous scenario. It would not last very long. And yeah, that amount of glass wouldn't do much in the event of, say, a loss of coolant accident with pressurized water at over 2,000 PSI and over 600 degrees Fahrenheit. No, that, that wouldn't do very much. <laughs> So the first thing you should do uh, when you load this game up, and uh, this is just a quick little tip, press escape, and go to options, scroll all the way down, and crank up the animation speed. And uh, you're probably sitting there going, well, wait, why? Uh, this is So this video contains uh, commentary. He's helped to help you play the game, and I will evaluate the... Uh the realism of this place. Why? Because when you run over here to actually push a button, you'll notice it has to go through an animation to push the button. You know, if I'm going to grab onto this knob, you have to actually animate that knob, and it takes time for you to finish that up. Now that's a cool feature, showing the act showing the action of what it's like to operate some of these switches. That's that's a pretty cool feature. And if it's an absolute emergency, of course, and you're cranking on those things, um, you've already wasted too much time. <laughs> it's kind of one of those little things. Another really really quick tip of this game too is if uh, you hold down the shift key, uh, you run a little faster. This control room is huge and just very, very empty. I mean, it's actually probably around the same size, but there's, you know, desks, computers, areas where the uh, control room supervisor and the reactor operators would do a lot of, you know, work. Uh, 
just paperwork, uh, computers, sending emails, uh, anything you would at any other office job. But here it's like just the controls by itself. It's not the controls and an office. And in some nuclear power plants, you could actually have multiple units being controlled from the same room. That wasn't the case where I worked, but it's not uncommon for it to be the case. But if you hold down a strafe key and a movement key, you move twice as fast. So if you see me ripping around like a bishop, which is like, why are you doing this? Um, this is a unity at its best right here, because these two speeds actually add together to make you move even quicker. I know it looks really, really awkward, and it's uh, definitely not RP-like, but uh, believe it or not, it is a fantastic technique. So what I'm going to do today is uh, basically walk you around how to get the thing started. I'm also going to show you kind of what All does right, so we're at the start up. Okay, that radiation suit over there in this really crazy, um, with a mannequin almost display like you're, like you're selling protective clothing, no, you don't see that. First off, you don't see these in a control room. The control room is not in a radiological controlled area. Now, it's not unheard of, but the control room would be one of the most difficult areas to actually get contaminated. Well, for one, it's nowhere near any sources of radiation. And even if there was a radioactive release, the control room is actually protected by an HVAC boundary that exerts a positive pressure over the room. In other words, things are just going to get pushed out. So any contaminants that would affect the ventilation, that would, you know, get into the air, that stuff is going to be pushed out by a back pressure in addition to a whole bunch of filters in case any of it would slip through. So that um, you wouldn't you wouldn't need these in in the control room. But I can tell they might have gotten some of this from seeing people like working at Chernobyl, for instance. Well, Chernobyl is a horrible example because they didn't even have a true containment building. So that's that's a whole mess. But even in radiological controlled areas, I've never seen them on some type of display mannequin thing. They're typically in a pile, just like any other um, laundry. There, it's an organized pile sorted by size, but you know, you typically go through there and you pick which size that you need. So my first stop here, of course, is I'm gonna run upstairs and then we're gonna go take a look at the backup generator here. Oh, there's so an the upstairs. way that this plan okay. works, and again, I ignore my little bishop movement here, but it, look at how fast you go like this. Um, so first thing we take a look at, of course, that is something that's actually considered is operator response times in their their speed. So being able to walk to certain parts of the plant to do important local actions that are important to safe shutdown. These are timed. Now, this is now keep in mind these actions are not required to be done to shut down the plant under normal conditions or even under a typical accident. These are extreme scenarios where you'd have to do anything locally, but this person would probably set a record. I've never seen an operator scurry up the stairs that quickly. <laughs> is your internal supply room. This is where your backup generator is. You can actually buy up to two of these at a time. Now, the cool you thing with the backup them. generator, of course, is it basically keeps you going while everything else is. <laughs> you can buy up to two of these. You're going to want at least two. The plant that I worked at had three. And keep in mind, each one of these had powered everything you needed to safely shut down the plant. And the idea of just having one, no, that, that wouldn't fly today. <laughs> completely broken, so to speak. You also have these packs of backup batteries. If you were to run over here and open one of these things, you'll notice there's none in here. Uh, the reason being is all of our batteries right now, if you wanted like 20 of these, you could store them. But realistically, all your batteries are actually stored right here. And you can tell by the charge level that they're doing well. And we're not actually running anything off the backup batteries right now. So in here, this is your master breaker for this entire facility here. That's sure what it means by backup batteries. If he's talking specifically for the diesel, for like starting the diesel, or if he's talking about batteries for the instrumentation. Because batteries for the instrumentation, there are, you typically have a, again, a couple of options available just like the diesels and batteries would be in an uninterruptible power supply configuration. So when you do, so if you do lose power, then you're still going to have access to your instrumentation and then the diesel will start in about eight seconds. One of the things you'll see here is how much energy we're generating. You also have switches to turn everything on or off should you need it. Like if I want to cut down everything, I just 
and cut the whole system off if I needed to. And again, if you're really, really, really dying for power, you might have to come up here. But generally, I don't think I've had to change that yet. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, though, is that this thing does burn fuel pretty quick. Uh, this is, you know, it's a big angry diesel engine kind of a thing. If you do want <laughs> to put gas diesel. in it, a lot of people see this and they try to click like this and it doesn't work. Um, the reason for that is you have to have a fuel can in your hand. And if you just kind of left click on one of these. Oh, stuff, that's going to eat through those tiny things so, so quickly. Um, this will be a, for, for one, the diesel's a bit smaller than normal, but it's possible this is a smaller reactor and you just might not need as many of the larger support systems, but it's going to burn through gas cans he's, he's right about that super quickly to give you the sense of scale the diesel uh storage tanks and each one could would last designed to last the diesel for about a week um over sixty thousand gallons yeah and run over and actually then press and hold you'll see that he sits there and go Bleh! and just splashes it in now uh, one of the cool things here is you see how this can is still red that means it's still fuel in it it'll change color as it runs out of gas and when it's completely empty just run over here and thump, Dump it right in the dumpster and you're good to go. That's funny. The next stop, of course, uh, excuse me. The diesels would be filled. Um, they would be pumped in. There would be an even larger tank. So I mentioned 60,000 gallon tank. There's a, there'd be a bigger tank that's, I forget, but it's north of uh, half a million gallons. And you would just um, start pumps. You would pump it in through another tank. Um, if you're having to fill diesels with fuel by hand, it's, it's a bad day. They exist. These things exist, but... What he's showing is probably similar to like a third string backup diesel that you would have in the event of a Fukushima type situation where all of your diesels fail and you need to bring in even more things and bring in hand -mitt supplies, piping, that sort of thing. But this wouldn't be like an, an in-house uh, diesel generator. After Fukushima happened and the thing that happened there was the site lost all electric power that including all the on-site backup. So what was done in the U.S. was we set up an additional um, remote facility that could bring in supplies such as diesels and fuel, and it is located far away from other sites. So in the event of an accident or, or, or a, a natural disaster such as an earthquake or a or hurricane or something happens at a site and destroys everything, you could bring in um, additional equipment to um, to protect the reactor. Well, like I said, hilarious movement here. I'm sure the game developer is going to watch this one. This is a relatively tight this niche group fast. here. And he's going to go, oh, I should fix that. Please don't fix it. I like it the way it is. So um, we're going to run in here now and take a look at a couple more buildings. Uh, right through here, of course, is going to be our reactor. Is going to be through here. This is the reactor. Yeah, and uh, you can stand right up here on the edge and uh, look down into it if you want, if you want to be silly. Enter the reactor core containment building. I don't know how much of a containment building this is if the door is wide open. There would be an airlock to this thing. And a true containment building isn't just, you know, you should, can't go in here. That would be more of a confinement building. A containment building is can withstand pressures. So the entrance is going to be an airlock, similar to what you would see on a spacecraft. Got no radiation poisoning or anything. We're not generating anything. Uh, this water, by the way, you can't so they swim. are shut down. So if you do That's something true. really stupid and just take a step into the water, you've just killed yourself. And in this game, there's no, um, what I call, respawning, if that makes sense. Okay, um, this must just be a video game mechanic. There, there have been other video games that you talk, take a step into the water, you wouldn't, that I've seen, it, it kills your character off. <laughs> But you could go in the water. Now, you still don't want to get too close uh, to the uh, fuel assemblies. Um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission standard is 23 feet above the top of the fuel assemblies is how much water between you and it. And this looks considerably lower if those are indeed the tops of uh, fuel assemblies. Not to say it will become unsafe if you get less than 23 feet. But you don't want to go under there and bear hug one of these, because even though while the reactor is shut down, unless it's entirely fresh fuel, you're still going to have, you're still going to be exposed to the fission products. Because a lot of times this fuel is, is recycled. And there's still subcritical multiplication that occurs. So some fissions are happening, but not enough to create a self-sustaining reaction. But yeah, you could potentially be exposed to a lethal dose if you were to go under and bear hug a fuel assembly somehow if you mess up you messed up 
So that's just something you got to kind of keep in the back of your head. Uh, if you come down this hallway over here, you know, it's going to take you to the generator hall. And keep in mind, we're level one right now with no prestige points. And now you can see no this lovely room points. is where our turbine generators will be. And with I wish time, I got you can see all these empty spaces here. You can actually add more generators to it. Room. So like your kind of version one of the reactor, if that makes sense, is really a version one of this reactor. You know, it's very much basic. And you're going to add on to it with time. And we'll take a look at how you do that as well. So this might be like SimCity or something where you upgrade your reactor by starting off like that. Maybe you can upgrade and have an actual containment building. Wow. So let's head up to the control room and uh, start getting this thing rolling here. It doesn't take too much to get it going. And unfortunately, uh, uh, the way they designed it is like, you're going to be busy, to say the least. So the first thing we do is uh, we're going to come climbing in here and we're going to hit some... If you're going to have to do a reactor startup, you're going to probably have, at least within the control room, maybe four or five reactor operators. Technically you only need two, but at least at the plant I worked at, I've seen about that many. Um, two or three supervisors, maybe even a couple of shift managers. You're gonna have a ton of plant operators, basically guys that do things outside of the control room. Easily, easily 20. And that mainly just because there's, but there's probably a lot of things in this game that you're not, that they're gonna skip just because it's less fun and more of sit up and or just hurry up and wait. Like, I doubt this game includes uh, doing a fill and vent of a heat exchanger in the uh, turbine building, for instance. Switches, and again, each one of these systems is gonna have its own little switch on the side to activate it. You wanna make sure you set all these in turn. Be I've never seen switches that you push all the way forward like that. That's a little, that's a little different. Leave the batteries alone, kind of a thing like that. Again, just come over here, activate it. Uh, one thing I want to do while I'm over here is I'm actually going to put the reactor onto standby mode. See this operational mode? I'm just going to like that, pop it over to nominal. Nothing. Operation. Um, I've seen mode selector switches. I mean, so that's at least taking something. Never seen the word nominal, though. That'll happen. Don't worry. Go ahead and push that right there. That's going to click on. I'm going to go ahead and push that right there. Snap that on as well. Here's our coolant flow. And again, we'll talk about what all these are in a few minutes. just turning so on the control panel. here. So we'll. You wouldn't turn them off per se, but I guess maybe he's probably going to get a bunch of alarms now since, you know, he's a lot of conditions. Is, if I'm guessing these panels assume you're at power and well, you're not. So it's probably going <laughs> to send some things are out of whack. What we have here is this whole panel is basically broken into multiple sections. Uh, this is kind of, I sort of consider this to be the... Um, what was the best way to say fuel this? this is sort of the fuel side of things. And honestly, you're not going to spend okay. a lot of time over here. The one thing we do do, though, is you notice how it says it's unloaded. And remember how I pointed out that the core was still poking out of the reactor? You can actually come over here and push that button. That plays this little nice video if you can actually watch the core be pushed in. And if you look at the top now, you can see that the core is now in the center of the reactor vessel itself. So now it is already. Yeah, uh, that would. I've never seen. That would be so cool if you could just do that. <laughs> Usually it's a bunch of highly trained people um, operating cranes and delicate uh, lifting equipment and this sort of operation of putting the core's head and everything back together can take several shifts during an outage. To go. If we needed to extract that, of course, we could do that. 12 keep hours. in mind, you can't pull a dead reactor core out. Again, these things will last for days of game time, so don't worry about ripping it out just yet. But keep in mind, if you did want to do that, we'd have to actually empty the whole reactor and it's such a process. So this guy right here is our pressurizer. This is a pressurized water reactor. Basically- Okay, if it's pressurized, how? It, why is it vented to atmosphere? <laughs> That's why it needs to be bottled up inside of a, a vessel. What this is going to do is it's going to build up enough pressure to kind of keep things going. And notice what it says, if you don't keep the pressure up high enough, you can't keep the refrigerant, you know, the coolant, the water, and basically in a state that's liquid, it'll do other things. So. Never heard anyone refer to it as a refrigerant. Mm, no, it's a, it, it's a coolant. Now, boiling doesn't occur in a pressurized water reactor, but it does in the, it, within the normal reactor coolant system, but it does within the pressurizer. And that's how it, it basically creates a bubble that pushes down on the mass of water in order to bring it up to a higher pressure. And it's, I'm not surprised that they're using a pressurized water reactor, because I'm assuming, again, nucleares, Portuguese, Portugal doesn't have any, and Brazil's two reactors are both pressurized water reactors, so that kind of makes sense. But again, unless they show that um, the reactor being bottled up, I don't see how you're going to have a pressurized water reactor. 
we're going to do is we're just going to flip this sucker on real quick. And this is going to start using quite a bit of electricity. And what it will actually start to do is it'll start heating up the whole pressurizer side of the reactor. Now, we need this to be warm to generate any power. And we also need this to be warm to basically get things cycling. This thing heats to heat up, up the fast. reactor. As a matter of fact, if I were to come over here and look, you can actually see how the pressure is starting to build up on it on its own. Even though the reactor itself, we haven't even set the reactor off. So apparently it is, the, the vessel is close. Maybe the vessel is just submerged in water. Like the water is outside of the vessel and the pipes are going in. I've never seen that. Because otherwise, yeah, if you're turning on heaters and, and the pressurizer without the uh, reactor system being put back together, it's not gonna do you any good. It's uh, no problem there. This does take a while. It's considered kind of bad form to get this up to temperature before this has got a little bit of pressure and temperature. But the good news again <laughs> yes. is we're just running off the internal right now. And by the way, you can see we're just burning it down right now. So I'm going to leave this alone for now. Uh, we have the control rods. We'll get back to that in a second. And then, of course, yeah, we have later. our turbine generators, which can, we're going to leave alone for a second. But now we're going to float over to the core. Oh, it's plural. So he has multiple generators. So the plant I had had um, just one really, really big one. But it's not unheard of. Nuclear power plants do produce a lot of electricity, so you can have multiple turbines, multiple generator systems set up. Flint system. So basically, I'm going to kind of put my head here. I wish I had a little mouse. I could show you kind of what's going on here. But our coolant system takes heat away from the reactor. Our steam generator takes heat out of the coolant, and our condenser cools everything back down so that this process here can be cycled. That's exactly this right. This side of things is basically one giant loop. Mm -hmm. This is the one that's actually going to be pulling heat out of the reactor for the purposes of getting work done. You know, you can notice right now in this game, we only have pump three. You know, once you spend your prestige points, you'll have three pumps here, and it makes a huge difference as far as how hard you can... <laughs> prestige points. So... Never seen it where a reactor is done incrementally. So the plant I worked at had four loops. Uh, so four reactor coolant pumps, four reactor coolant loops, four steam generators. Though they would all, uh, the pipes would all combine into, um, into one header, go to, the tur go to the main turbine, to the condenser, through the feed water system, and then back around, just like you said. But it never started off as like a one loop plan, a two loop plan, a three loop plan. So this one's a three loop plan, which is, I see what I did there. Um, but yeah, uh, I've never, I've never heard of that. If you were to do something like this, it would involve complicated licensing processes where you would probably spend just as much on engineering and design calculations as you would on the actual materials to upgrade your power plant run this and how hot you can get everything. At the beginning of the game, we're, we're pretty basic here. But what we want to do is you do want to start to get some coolant going. Now, a lot of people, of course, like to mangle that button and set it to 49%, just like that. Um, people are like, wait, why? And of course, it's one of those things where you don't worry about it that much. You have these things called audits. I hit the tab key. Oh, that's and fun. Once in a while, they'll have these little, you must do this or you must do that. Or, you it's must get this a under certain iPad. percentage. And this is something that people try to do is like just to kind of like almost get ahead of the game. But it really doesn't matter. So a lot of procedures are very specific about how you go up in both in terms of a plant heat up and a plant um, startup and what things you put in the secondary plant at certain power levels. But at least in terms of the uh, reactor coolant pumps, they just had one speed. And when you turn the first pump on, you would actually see it would just go straight up to 100% coolant flow for that individual loop. Now... What's interesting is because it's all it's four loops connected, you're actually going to have flow in the opposite direction at a much lower rate going through the other three loops. So I don't know if these other loops haven't been installed yet, but what you should see is when you turn on a pump, um, it's going to cause flow in one of the loops and then back flow in the other loop or other two loops or however many loops this, this plant has. But ours didn't have the ability to adjust speeds but that's not to say one couldn't be designed that way i mean i'm good with that so we're going to go ahead and get that started i'm just going to reach over there set the speed start circulating it now uh, because uh, we do want to get that uh, circulating right away of course uh, as this is going uh, you're going to get a little warning on the bottom to say hey you're starting to move some cooling around is that intentional uh, the next thing we want to do is if you come over that's, to our that's true here, you, would. you see how it's got a level this level is very dangerously low. Uh, once it starts turning into steam, we're blah, blah, it's going to drop right off the bottom, and then we're going to run into a problem where you're going to get this fun little racing condition where you're going to pop the breakers off. Don't do that. So instead, what we're going to Basically, you don't want your condenser to get too low because then the, the condensate pumps, which feed the feed water loop, 
to continue that cycle going would trip on low level because they wouldn't have enough suction to work properly. At least they should have an automatic trip function, like you said. Otherwise, the pumps will just start to eat themselves because they don't have any water going into them. They're just going to come over here. We're going to hit load in the condenser, and that's going to start flooding it up with some water. So while we do this, of course, ah, that's too fast. We'll do a medium speed here. I'm just going to start circulating it. Remember, this is the thing that cools. Again, everything with adjustable speed. That. That's interesting. So as we're starting to build that, we'll start to do it. So we're starting to see that our vessel pressurizer is uh, catching up pretty darn quick. It's a good time, of course, to reduce my heating and temperature a little bit. Again, welcome to the control scheme here this can be so awkward nope also i don't know what this guy's wearing but you wouldn't need to wear gloves to operate something and these levels look like surgical gloves in the control room typically just wear just barehanded now operating valves in the field or breakers in the field you might need you know gloves just cut resistant gloves or electrical safety gloves but in a control room you don't really need to wear any ppe come on this is so awkward. There we go. Perfect. That's going to start cooling itself down. So now we're ready to go ahead and pull some control rods and actually get this thing going. Now this controls the control rods. Which so we just skipped several steps. I don't know if we did some time compression or not, but it can take several shifts to get um, the reactor both heated up and um, fully pressurized. And not to say many types of tests are done at each plateau in temperature and in pressure and in power level. So just Keep all that in mind, but that wouldn't make for as good gameplay. So I can understand, you know, multiple shift time compression again to get us to the point where we actually want to start up the reactor. It determines how much heat our core is going to produce. So if I set this to 96%, you can actually watch in the little video there that the control rods are going to slide up and they're going to allow the nuclear reaction to kick off, which is going to happen pretty much right away. And you can see how this starts to heat up. Mm, no. Uh, you wouldn't it wouldn't kick off right away because there is so there's so much margin built into the control rod system in a nuclear power plant in real life that it can take a while to uh, get the reactor to start up because you have what's known as shutdown banks which uh, which are known as shutdown rods which will keep you shut down which are way more than you need to shut down so you can pull all of the shutdown rods which depending on the pl on the reactor design, can be half of the control rods in there, pull them all fully out, reactor still shut down. Now, an oper operators are trained to be ready to anticipate um, criticality or the moment where the reactor is on and creating a self-sustaining fission reaction at any time, but you'd never see it just from pulling the shutdown rods. And then you get to the control rods, and this is a heavily oversight regulated process you even have reactor engineering specialists in there to assist you and it would be long briefings calculations analyses to tell you around when you would expect to be uh, to take the unit critical and yeah so this is be this is another long process now this wouldn't take this shouldn't take multiple shifts but it's there's a lot more there's a lot more going on there <laughs> immediately so i think we've got plenty of water right now i'm actually going to shut this off and you can see right over here how we're just starting to kind of crash up here towards that 100 level now keep in mind this thing will kind of balance itself out sure as, the it's units are so in. as long as you get really close to 100 you really shouldn't have too much trouble here so what's happening now i usually see level as percent but it could just be the height of the tank or or the condenser what have you, you can see it in you know feet meters centimeters whichever is I can see that our we're totally warmed up on the pressurizer. I'm gonna go ahead and pop that off real quick. And again, 160, and you know, we'll let it run a little longer here. 160 is kind of the sweet spot, but you're gonna be playing with it. And you can see my main reactor I'm heating not up seeing real fast. Units. Oh, this is fun to watch. <laughs> okay. I think I can tell what they're basing this on. They're basing this on like tests that you see in labs or um, universities for those type of reactors you're never going to see one pulse in real life for a full-size commercial nuclear reactor that produces a thousand megawatts no <laughs> such a such a thing you you would never see that that happening now and i know this isn't supposed to be one of those because they said pressurized water reactor so but it looks like they got the reactor vessel in a, a water tube and <laughs> if it was really pressurized you wouldn't see any flash or anything because the vessel would keep anything secured even if you were to uh somehow create those sort of uh pulsing conditions but yeah this is uh quite this is quite inaccurate <laughs> 
I can tell they've I can tell whoever designed this got got inspired from some of the Trigger pulse pulse reactors though. So there you have it. It's real fun if you want to have some. That's the reactor going critical there. By the way, that doesn't mean complete. That would actually be going prompt critical, which is what you would never want to see. <laughs> Because that was when the reactor goes from milliwatts to megawatts in a fraction of a second. Again, based on fuel design, fuel loading, control rod position, um, enrichment of the fuel, and how it's placed in there, you would never see something like this. N not even at Chernobyl. Chernobyl put themselves into a condition like that, but that was because of multiple um, param design parameters were exceeded and ignored, as well as from multiple different angles. I'll pin a comment with a more detailed review of what all happened there, but you would never see this in a pressurized water reactor. Chernobyl was not a pressurized water reactor, by the way. It was a, it's, it was a weird type of boiling water reactor known as an RBMK. Boom. That just means we're warming up kind of a thing like that. And uh, we now have a reactive reactor. <laughs> it just reacts. It's overreacting all the time. Now nah, and if, if anything, before you'd even approach something like that, the reactor would shut itself down. Even a slight, um, a slight overpower would, the reactor would shut itself down, the control rods would fall in, the reactor trip breakers would open, and the control rods would fall in and hit the bottom in less than a couple of seconds. And especially in a pressurized water reactor, that system is highly robust. Um, basically, gravity would have to fail for the reactor protection system to not work. Uh, the cool thing here is, of course, uh, now that they're starting to produce some heat here, you're going to start causing some steam to be generated. Now, this thing is basically responsible for that. And the most important value we have on this entire panel is this guy right here. Which there's, a, one of, there's a milestone called the point of adding heat, and heat is generated just from decay heat from the pressurizer heaters, heat from the reactor coolant pumps. But when you get around 1% power, that's when... You, the heat is actually coming from the fission. I have no idea what power they're at. The whole prompt critical thing, that means they were they were in the megawatt range and then it shut themselves down a bit. If there is what would have happened, it would have been like a start and a shutdown if it happened to anything like those uh, those pulse reactors. But here we're entering in uncharted and unrealistic territory. <laughs> that means the amount of water we basically are coolant, they're calling it here, that's inside the steam generator. As we produce more heat and as we start to increase the flow of heat, we have to use basically manipulate this knob for the purposes of controlling the amount of steam we're generating. Now, if this value starts to get too high, we have no room for steam, you're going to trip the generator. If you allow this to get too low because you weren't keeping up with it, what's going to happen is you'll trip the generator again. Not necessarily the case. There is a steam dump or turbine bypass uh, valve, which would basically Stend steam instead of going to the turbine there will just be a line that sends it straight to the condenser um it's not uncommon to have those valves um open to an extent while you're while you're starting up and it, now it's a very control and it's a very controlled process unlike what you saw with the uh prompt critical thing but i've never heard of a situation where excessive steam demand um by itself resulted in a generator trip now what steam demand will do was it will it actually will actually drive reactor power. There is a saying that um, reactor power follows steam demand in pressurized water reactors because raised steam flow will lower temp temperature. Lowering temperature will actually increase reactor power, and then they'll reach another equilibrium state at a higher power level. And the main reason when you do that, and typically when you do that, is you just add load to the uh, to the generator. And that will uh, cause that system to occur. That will also happen if you see a steam leak, though. But if you have an, any um, off-normal procedure where you have an excessive steam demand, you would actually end up shutting down the reactor. If Again, if the reactor protection system doesn't shut down itself, and it would be on low pressure because lowering temperature is going to lower pressure in the primary, uh, the, the reactor systems, and then it's going to shut itself down or then the reactor protection system would engage. Because your steam pressure will basically drop off. This little gauge right here is basically your magic thing to tell you what amount of speed we need on this, which of course is indicative of how much heat you're pulling off the reactor itself. So if you flip back over here, you can see uh, we're getting real, real high with the pressurizer. I'm gonna shut this off. We don't need that to be that high. <laughs> 
And my reactor itself is overboiling, uh, which now means that's a good sign. And we're going to start producing. Boiling of anything in a pressurized water reactor is never a good sign. If this was a boiling water reactor, then sure, but no, <laughs> just no. Pressure, as a matter of fact, if I hold my mouse right here, do you see how pressure is starting to be generated? But also notice that this is starting to creep downwards. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and slam that to slow. And we're gonna go ahead and start it up. So what this is going to start doing now is it's going to be start pulling basically water out of this side of things, shoving it in here, boiling it off, and then it's gonna take what's boiled off and it's gonna send it over to our buddy, the turbine generator. Now the turbine generator itself is not going to be moving very fast. Interesting that you have to go to that and then go back over to the turbine generator panel. Usually things are, the control panels are almost in order where the turbine generator would be on the right side. Again, a, a minor thing, but there is some ergonomics to be taken into consideration, especially when you have a limited number of uh, reactor operators to, uh, to work with. And uh, you'll see this thing barely starting to spin up in a few moments here. And uh, when that starts to do that, we're actually producing some power here. Now notice That's here cool that I'm the starting to get very low on cooling. It means the speed here is too low. So I'm going to crank this up to about 40. And what you're going to see is you're going to see this needle come down as we boil all that steam. And then it's going to start shifting back up. On the note of these controllers, so a lot of these you don't have to operate them manually. Like the speeds and like the steam flows and like how fast the pumps are going. Well, the pumps, well, it wouldn't be the pump speed, but it would be the valve it would be a valve position to tell you how much flow is actually going back into feed water versus how much flow is just going to be on on uh, on recirculation. Um, a lot of these would be an automatic, so you don't necessarily have to babysit the controllers as much. Now you would you would, you would still monitor and verify they respond properly in automatic, and if something does malfunction, you know the operator would need to take manual control. But typically, you can let it you can let it go in auto. Now, the interesting thing here is if I run back over here, you can see my reactor is still only 180 degrees. You know, we're barely boiling anything right now. But again, boiling's not the... If you're pressurized, you should never be at a point where you're boiling. And 180 degrees, even if he's talking... That's low. Even if you're talking Celsius, um, you should be... The average temperature should be around uh, 600 Fahrenheit. So yeah, 183 Celsius is still super cold. This gives you an idea of just the tremendous amount of thermal power of these reactors. Now, if I swing over here, you can see that my steam generator is starting to sneak back up. That means we're providing too much water. So we're just going to come here and crank this back down a little bit. And you'll see how it starts to uh, decrease how fast, by the whole way. Hold right click here. Yeah, you'd have feed value. regulating valves right. to help you with that. Now, <laughs> something important here is when we produce steam, our condenser here, if you want to think about this as the giant cooling towers, is going to try to take that steam and convert it back into water and basically eject the heat energy from it. When it does that, it's going to warm up. Now, this is when things get interesting for us. That means that this speed, this little handle right here, is determining how much heat we can essentially reject. So what's going to happen is if we cross this magic 100 threshold, that means we're going to start boiling off our coolant. Um, that will cool things down, yes. Also notice, by the way, how this... Keep in mind, he's referring to the sec he's referring to the secondary loop. This is he's not referring to the actual re reactor coolant system. Is it running away on us already? So I'm just going to grab this and crank it down a couple notches. Again, we don't want it to get too high. But also notice how much pressure we're generating Man. already. It's like, just like that. A lot of controller babysitting. So, so let's go run back over to our system here. You can see it pressurizes it's a little high, not bad. Um, our temperature is 250. It's warming what up. What are the units quick. in pressure? But notice we're producing electricity. So we're actually ready to go ahead and uh, switch this. You're producing electricity. Have you not Have you not synced it yet? Or Okay, or, or, he's, or it means he's about to produce electricity. Off to the electrical grid. Uh, once that's on, of course, so we can go ahead and shut off our generator. So that's going to be a delicate timing process because you're going to need to use a synchroscope in order to see if the generator is in phase with the rest of the grid. Because while nuclear power plants produce a lot of power, they're still tiny compared to the entire rest of the grid that's, that's going on. And you just, you really want to make sure you're in phase. Otherwise, you could break your generator. And when I say in phase, I'm referring to alternating current. Uh, the uh, make sure your peaks are matched with the peaks of what's up. Uh, of what's happening in the grid. So to compare it to a, another video game, like in uh, Super Mario Brothers, when you're jumping on the moving platforms, this when to sync the generator is the equivalent of when, of are you jumping when the platform is close to you or when the platform is moving away from you. That is exactly what this sort of process is. 
because we now have the ability to produce our own power. And now things start to get really, really interesting really, really quickly. Now notice I have not touched this yet. I'm just controlling the uh, temperature and the cooling, if you want to think about, not through the primary coolant system, but by how much steam I'm using basically to uh, turn into electricity and how best I can cool it off of the condenser. Remember, the condenser is basically the final place for all the heat we generate here. And it only has a maximum limit of how much heat it can reject. That's just one of those things. Oh, notice how this is starting to creep left again. So we're just gonna go ahead and add a couple percentages here. And just because remember, reactor's getting a lot warmer. Actually, we'll kick it a little bit higher. We'll go up to 40% here. Swing back over to the coils itself. You can see we're about uh, 360s ideal here, but um, again, we're about 300 degrees. We could probably slow the uh, temperature climb here. Go down to 97. And again, that's just- What is he doing that's like a calculator? So position, is that control off. rod again, You don't need a lot of pull in order to control that temperature. Yeah, usually you have a, now this one is your, you, you, this one I'm used to seeing being manually adjusted in order to, and there's so many control circuits and how well each of these things interact with each other that you don't have to do nearly as much babysitting. But I will say control rods are typically operated manually, especially when you're starting up or raising reactor power in this case. And keep in mind, each of these operations that affect reactivity are going to be peer checked by another reactor operator and oversight is going to be given by a supervisor. So everyone is going to know what you're doing and how it affects these other reactor systems as you're moving this thing. It's really cool. I can kind of understand for the purpose of the game though, why they didn't make it in auto just to teach you sort of how things affect each other. So while I've noticed that a lot of these numbers are off and it can let you do things, some things that don't have you makes that don't really make a lot of sense. It is teaching you what in, um, Nuclear operations we call integrated plan operations, which is basically how something affects something else, how what you're doing to the condenser affects, rea affects the reactor. And it's the orders of magnitude are off, but the, the overall concepts are there. And it's really cool to see that in a video game. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and call it a part. I'm going to go ahead and call it a part for now. Um, there will be a second part to this. Thanks so much for the recommendation, though. This is a really cool looking, shiny video game. And again, I didn't expect it to be as accurate as a real simulator. I kind of don't want it to be. That might that might throw some people who are at, on the fence of learning nuclear a little bit off because it would be too much too quick. But this is uh, this is definitely a cool thing. So stay tuned for part two. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.